Hi everyone, this is Counseling 2250, Robinson Wood, Chapter 5, People of Native American and Alaskan Native Descent. All right, so um, this is the beginning of the section in this class, this semester, where we're going to actually start to focus on various cultures, okay? And one thing that I definitely want to, again, uh, uh, remind everyone is this will not apply to everyone who identifies within this culture. What we're doing is we're going to look at some statistics, um, some generalizations when it comes to a specific culture so that we can keep these things in mind when we have clients that might be in this culture. Okay, so to focus on, let's say, let's uh, socioeconomic status or SES, to be able to be aware of why people in this culture might have uh, or might be living in a lower SES um, and stuff like that, so that we're sensitive and respectful to this culture. Again, if you identify in any of these cultures, which most likely you will, um, you're going to potentially say, oh, we don't do this in our culture. And that's totally valid, right? Again, we are not saying that everyone will fit into these types of um, uh, generali generaliz generalized uh, statements. And also think about it as in uh, generations as well. People who were raised in 2020, it's going to be different than people who were raised in the 1950s, right? So again, uh, the culture will shift and change as well. All right, so now let's talk about Native American and Alaska Natives. Their origins is in any of the original peoples of North, South, and Central America who maintain global, uh, I'm sorry, maintain tribal affiliation. There are four Native American forefathers known as Chief Joseph, Sitting Bull, Geronimo, and Red Cloud. And in the slide right here, you will see a picture or an illustration of them uh, in front of Mount Rushmore, which are the four presidents that were from Europe, right? Co uh, colonists, colonialists. Yes. Um, and then, of course, we talk about Jose the Acosta theory, which is, um, hey, where did Native Americans come from or Natives come from? And so he was a 16th century Spanish Jesuit missionary, and he studied geophysical science. Um, and he wrote a book called the Historia Natural y Moral de la Indias in 1590. And what that was all about was just kind of understanding, hey, where did Native Americans come from? Like, they definitely were not originally from the Americas, they migrated here. So where did they migrate from? So the North America was settled before the birth of Christ by a group of hunters and their families. Again, this is the theory. Following a large and mostly extinct animal herds, passed over a land bridge, which is a narrow strait uh, from Asia called the Bering Strait. So if you look at this image right here, Russia and Alaska used to be connected. Um, let's say if there was less water in the ocean, right? Because there's more ice, right? When you have ice, the water goes down because the ice pulling the water, right? And so there was maybe a land strip uh, that existed back then. And so uh, maybe these tribal people basically were following a herd of animals migrating or something like that and were hunting them. And so they actually crossed the Bering Strait into Alaska and then from there, you know, shifted down to the rest of the Americas. And that's what the theory is when it comes to the existence of Native Americans here. Uh, the Russian Tsar Peter the Great hired Danish navigator Vitus Bering to explore the eastern Russian border. And so the Bering Strait is named after the Danish navigator Vitus Bering, even though the name of it, the spelling is different. Although people agree about the Bering Strait theory, the exact timing is still debated. They think maybe it happened 15,000 to 30,000 years ago. That's a really long time ago, right? So definitely um, Christopher Columbus did not discover it. Uh, it was already discovered. He just happened to not himself know it. Doesn't mean that he discovered it, right? It's just like if you've never seen an iPhone before, you finally see an iPhone one day, you're like, I discovered the iPhone. No, you yourself might have just learned about it, but it's been in existence for a long time, right? Although people agree about the Bering Strait theory, the exact timing, again, is uh, debated. DNA evidence shows three distinct genetic mutations in Mongolia and Siberia. So when they start to do DNA testing, that's when they're like, oh, wait a minute, there are some common uh, uh, characteristics when it comes to the people who live in Native or in, in America uh, to people who are living in Mongolia and Siberia, which is uh, connected to Russia. 
article in Nature by Callaway in 2014 said that they found a two-year-old boy ceremonially buried uh, about 12,600 years ago in Montana. So the ancestry of one of the earliest populations in the Americas known as the Clovis culture. Uh, the genome sequence shows that native people of North, South, and Central America are all descendants from one population that trekked from Asia, Siberia, and East Asian ancestors. Um, and the 52 Native American tribes show genetic affinity to this boy. So what that's saying is when they tested all the different tribes, there was actually very similar things or similar characteristics in the DNA to this two-year-old boy that was buried in Montana 12,600 years ago. So you can see that maybe that group started to separate, you know, and move to different areas. And so even though they're now their own tribes, that they were once all one tribe that split. Native American stories tell about being brought into existence by the Great Spirit coming from the womb of the Mother Earth and old Spider Woman and Earth uh, Woman together make creation, Earth, creatures, plants, and light. So this is how their philosophy of how the world was created, right? We hear about that with, let's say, with the Bible, is a, their own interpretation. Native Americans and Alaskan Natives had this perspective. We do not argue against and say, no, mine is right, yours is wrong, because this is about their spirituality, right? Which is dogma, which is something that you usually don't question. You accept it as part of their culture and their tradition, and then you live with it, right? Because sometimes when we have all these things, um, we'll start to ask questions about how things happen, and there's no answer because it probably would not necessarily make sense, right? So again, we're talking about spirituality, and this is their belief of how the world was created. And we respect every culture and how they think it is right or wrong, um, but it doesn't mean that we need to fight or, or put down other cultures uh, just because we think we are better than the other. We have to respect that every culture has their own histories, and that's how it is. Now let's talk a little bit about the history. Estimated 5,000 years ago, Native population was at its highest, 1 million inhabitants within the United States. In 1492, Christopher Columbus thought he landed in India and called the people Indian. Once Europeans discovered North America, the Native population was reduced to half through ethnic cleansing, which is basically, we don't like your people, we're going to kill you. Starvation, slavery, Genocide, again, genocide is killing a whole group of people just because of who they are. War, and the main one was disease, such as typhus, which is a bacterial infection, smallpox, and the measles. And I'm sure you're familiar with those other two. So again, the Europeans, when they came over, they basically wiped out half of the native population here through all these different things. In 1790, federal policies to displace native people occurred. In 1824, creation of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, BIA, was created. 566 federally recognized Native American tribes and Alaskan communities uh, were recognized then. Thomas McKinney, the first director of the BIA, uh, and also Native people saw the BIA as a betrayal, took their land and kept no promises. So basically what happened was uh, the, the conquerors, the colonialists, basically made all these promises to be respectful, but actually did not respect the Native Americans at all. And there were all these massive violence that did get uh, put upon Native Americans. And you can understand why, hopefully now, why Native Americans have a major distrust towards the government, American government, um, and also, you know, uh, uh, just, you know, refusal to really uh, allow, let's say, uh, drilling to happen in their in their areas because um, they're taking advantage of these natives who thought we had a deal but they were all those promises were all broken and they actually suffered the most out of it because of all this different types of violence that has been put upon them. War of 1812 European Americans defeated the British in 1821 European Americans took Florida from the Spanish uh, European Americans saw native people as a hindrance when they started their expansion. So they saw that the people, the Native American people were a bother. So they're definitely gonna try and, and get rid of them, right? If there's a pest and they describe them as let's say a pest or a bothersome new, a nuisance, right? You wanna get rid of it. Unfortunately, that is not respectful and not cool, right? And so this is why we need to be aware of our history, that our history is not 
glorious and beautiful and peaceful. There was actually a lot of violence that existed in America. Um, one country basically tried to take over another country. And that is, you know, uh, back then, uh, very, very um, uh, unjust, you know, unjust. The Indian Removal Act of 1830 under President Andrew Jackson from 1929 to 1937 relocate Indians west of the Mississippi. Okay, Once more Europeans immigrants came to America, they pushed the Native American people from Mississippi. Um, Jackson saw it as a benevolent because they were funding the relocation. So what that is saying is as the, the, the conquerors, right, they're like, well, we're, we're, we're going to spend our money to move you to a different area. So we're being really nice to you. Is that really being nice to force people to move where they don't want to, where they originally were the, the people who lived in the land, right? So again, you can see how there is such social injustice that still continues to this day. There's a lot of violence that you hear from Canadian natives as well as in American natives as well. Natives call the Trail of Tears moving the five civilized tribes of the Cherokees, the Chickawas, the Choctaws, the Creeks, and the Seminoles to Oklahoma. So they were cold, hungry, sick, hundreds died from starvation, exhaustion, disease, exposure, and accidents, right? It was, it was not a fun trip. It wasn't like, oh, let's all get together and like, let's move. It was, you know, basically forced movement, relocations to areas because more let's say uh, Western people were coming into America and they wanted more space to live. So they're just pushing the natives further and further west. Europeans saw it as, according to the US National Archives and Records Administration, allowing natives to live in their own way and under their own rude institution. So basically, word for word, what they're saying is that Native Americans are savage or uncivilized, so let's let them live the way they, they want to in their own land. However, only if it's convenient for us, right? But if they are living in a place where we want to live, we're going to push them out. We'll slow the decay uh, process of decay, lessening their numbers and hopefully under the influence of European Americans with good counsel to cast off their savage habits and become interesting, civilized, and Christian community. So again, Western people were basically putting themselves, forcing themselves onto Native American behaviors and traditions and say, throw away everything that you've always had and now you must accept us uh, Western people because we're better than you. That's what they said, right? Obviously that is really unjust as well, right? Every culture has their, their strengths and their amazingness, okay? So again, back then uh, people did not necessarily think that way. And I hope that, you know, as we progress forward, that we start to really understand the horrors that happen in our history. In 1928, Marion Report described the intense poverty and living conditions of the reservations, disease, morbidity rates, terrible care of children attending Indian boarding schools and land erosion. So they put natives into reservations, but they did not help them in any way. And when you force people to live in a way where they can't do what they want to do, um, you know, um, things start to destruct, unfortunately. In 1934, the Indian Reorganization Act, also known as the IRA, also known as the Wheeler-Howard Act or the Indian New Deal, promote the exercise of tribal self-governing powers. Uh, ended restrictions against Native religions. Before, they were like, you cannot practice your Native American religions, you have to practice Christian religion. In the 1960s and 70s, reinforced further transfer of administrative responsibility for tribal lands to Native people. In 1978, Americans Indian Religious Freedom Act to protect Natives who are being arrested for having eagle feathers or using peyote in religious ceremonies. Saw that Native ways of worship were essential part of Native life and this law sought to protect, preserve such religious liberties. So here's something that's really interesting, okay? So what they're saying is basically, you cannot hunt, let's say, the American uh, bald eagle, right? Because that is a symbol of America. However, Native Americans have feathers and stuff like that, let's say, as part of their culture and their tradition. Because the Western people were able to, let's say, make uh, the, the bald eagle as their thing, they're like, because we think they're important, therefore you are not allowed to have it, even though you have been living with them for, you know, centuries, it seems like, right? So 
the American Indian Religious Freedom Act allowed them to actually, you know, live in their traditional ways or as much as they can, and then also uh, be able to do things that they have always done and not be called uh, doing a crime, basically. Today, there are 266 heterogeneous groups with 252 tribal languages in the United States and Alaska. The largest Native American tribal groups are in the textbook on page 89. Um, they're talking about uh, Cherokee, Navajo, Choctaw, Mexican American Indian, Chippewa, Sioux, Apache, Blackfoot, Creek, and Iroquois. Now let's talk about the geography and the demography of uh, Native Americans and Alaska Natives. In 2014, 6.5 million Americans who identify as American Indian or Alaska Native. Um, this was either alone or in combination with one or more other races. So that means basically marrying and having children who are biracial or more than just two races, right? 2.9 million Americans identify as Native American or Alaska Native alone. 14 states with more than 100,000 Native Americans and Alaska Natives are California, Oklahoma, Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, Washington, New York, North Carolina, Florida, Alaska, Michigan, Oregon, Colorado, and Minnesota. The average age for marriage in the Native American population is women 27 years old, men are 30 years old. 68% live in family households. 20% is maintained by women only with no husband. Seven is maintained by men only, no wife. 32% are non-family households, which means basically having a roommate, right? So there's no marriage or living with unrelated people. More likely to live and care for grandchildren. 75% of Native Americans and Alaska Native children under five only speak English. So you can hear right now the history of, of this, you know, uh, colonialization is forcing uh, Native Americans to basically lose their language. So more and more children are not speaking their native languages, but only speaking English. And that's very sad. We're losing history, right? We're losing their history or they're losing their own history. So whenever you meet someone who is Native American, don't necessarily go, why don't you speak your language? Okay, because um, you might not understand that there was a whole forced, you know, um, uh, violence uh, against a, a whole group of people for speaking their own language. And you'll see that also with uh, Latinx people as well, right? Sometimes uh, there are Latinx people who don't speak Spanish. And part of that is if they have been living in America for a very long time, generations upon generations, uh, they were punished for speaking, let's say, Spanish. Same thing is happening with the natives as well. 20% uh, of Native Americans and Alaska Natives live inside American Indian areas, so it's federal reservations or off-reservation trust land. Unemployment on tribal land areas contribute to the population to move to urban areas. Because, so what's that saying is because there's not a lot of job opportunities, the Natives then have to leave their reservations, their homeland areas, their designated areas, into just urban cities to go work, to make money. Less than 50% of people living around or in tribal lands are employed, and bicultural survival is a reality for many. So what that is basically saying is that they can't just live their Native American traditional lives because of poverty and other things, so they actually have to come into, let's say, major cities to work, and that means that they have to learn how to behave in a different way, and imagine if they have to work there and live there, they're probably going to get married and have children there, and their children will also start to lose a sense of their cultural aspects, right? So you can, again, see how all of these things are all interconnected. Now let's talk about the social, psychological, and physical health issues. Native Americans and Alaska Natives have a large proportion of younger people and smaller proportion of older people. 28% are younger than 18, 7 are older than 65, and the median age is 30. The poverty levels, 30% poverty levels for Native Americans and Alaska Natives, and it's 16% for the U.S. So again, that's very high, right? It's, uh, basically double, and 36% of children live in poverty. Income. The median was $36,252 compared to $52,252 for the U.S. So you can see right there, there's um, uh, a huge difference between the, the, the median uh, income. 
Healthcare. 27% did not have a usual or normal source of health care and were not regularly seen by a doctor or a clinic compared to 15% of the U.S. Okay. High rates of depression among women. Men with low education, single, and low income have higher levels of depression. Western acculturation in Alaskan natives, higher rates of alcohol use, perceived stress. Um, stronger, you pick identity associated with less depression use of religion and spirituality to cope. So when they are saying is that if they do have a strong native uh, identity, they actually have less depression, right? But if they don't have a strong, let's say spiritual identity with their natives, uh, their own culture, there's more likelihood of it. And we're talking about people who live in poverty, people who are abused, raped, killed. And so their families are not necessarily going to be very happy, right? So there are higher rates of it. And there is a lot of abuse, unfortunately, that happens along uh, with the Native American culture. Um, high rates of intimate partner violence. That means basically domestic violence, right? More likely to be killed by an intimate partner and higher rates of rape than Latinos and Caucasians. So uh, women are experiencing higher percentages of sexual violence by their partners and so forth and so on. Alcohol use, according to the CDC, highest rates of binge drinking with Caucasians, uh, substance addictions and mental health, comorbidity, morbidity, basically meaning they have a substance abuse issue along with mental health issues as well. And sometimes they use, let's say, uh, substances to deal or to cope with their mental health, right? High levels of cirrhosis of the liver, high levels of unprotected sex, increasing of sexually transmitted infections because of that. Alcohol treatment program success rates for Native Americans are poor. Uh, we have to talk about nativized treatments. And nativized basically means standard treatments that have been adapted to be more culturally appropriate for Native populations. That means incorporating traditional healing techniques and ceremonies. And this is called nativized treatment. Now let's talk about diet. Diabetes up 50% among tribes. That's really high. Highest rates of colon rectal cancer. Poor health outcomes contribute to nearly one in three native deaths before 45. Education, 82% have high school or GEDs by age 25 and older. 18% have bachelor's degrees compared to 29 for people who live in the US in general. 31 tribes group, tribal groups have established their own tribal colleges. So you probably heard of historically black colleges or Hispanic serving institutions. There are also tribal colleges that exist because there is a need for a place for Native Americans to basically get an education that's respectful of their culture and um, they don't have to deal with, let's say, oppression and discrimination. Employment rates. 26% are employed in professional occupations compared to 38 with Caucasians. 22% are employed in sales and office occupations, which is similar to Caucasians. And 236,967 Native American and Alaskan owned businesses. So, you know, sometimes when uh, people feel like they're being discriminated, it's really hard to get a job. They'll start to make their own jobs or their own stores or shops and companies because they don't want to have to deal with it. And you'll see that. That's why you hear people say native uh, owned businesses or black owned businesses or, you know, um, whatever it is, um, because that means that there is a recognition that there is a lot of racism, oppression, discrimination that prevents them from being part of society in this way to make money and to be successful. Now let's talk about some contributions that Native Americans and Alaska Natives have contributed to the world. They were excellent farmers, so we're talking about farming techniques. Uh, invented the hammock. The hammock is basically that piece of fabric that you lay on between, let's say, two trees that you swing back and forth and you sleep on vacation and when you want to relax, right? Snowshoes, blowgun, bulb syringe, kayak, rubber boot, herbal oral contraception, bunk beds, petroleum extraction, pest control, wove cloth from feathers, crafted animal and bird decoys for hunting, and acid to etch designs into shells. Government and systems of thought, egalitarianism, service, pacifism. Iroquois ideas were central to the founding principles of American's constitution. So even there, you can see that uh, the Western people who conquered America and stole the land and killed people um, 
also use their ideas and their concepts in the Constitution. Now let's talk about acculturation. Acculturation is a culture change that occurs when two or more cultures are in persistent contact. A particular kind of acculturation is assimilation, in which one culture changes significantly more than the other culture, and as a result becomes to resemble it. This process is often established deliberately through force to maintain control over conquered people, but it can occur voluntarily as well. So let's talk about the five different levels of acculturation among native people. The number one is traditional, okay? Um, the next one is marginal. The third one is bicultural. Fourth is assimilation. And five is pan-traditional. And these things are described to you in your textbook as well. But let's talk about this just briefly here. Traditional is when may or may not speak English and will hold traditionally native values, including tribal customs, right? Marginal is identifies with neither mainstream values nor traditional values. So they're kind of like, they're not identifying with anyone. Bicultural knows and practices both mainstream and traditional values. Assimilated means holding the mainstream American values in high esteem to the exclusion of those native. So that basically means you're going to adopt Western culture as opposed to the Native American culture. And pan-traditional is embracing lost tradition values and beliefs and is often bilingual. So pan-traditional will be like, you know, accepting everyone, but also making sure that you don't forget your originals as well. So again, traditional means basically we are Native Americans and that is that we do not necessarily welcome or value the Western culture that is around us. And you can probably say that maybe even with your grandparents from your own countries and, you know, of ethnicity, not necessarily Native American, right? Marginal, meaning I kind of don't identify with either. I'm just going to live my life. Bicultural means that you see both and you celebrate both and you value both. So it would be an example as, you know, maybe a Native American who practices their Native spirituality but also celebrates Christmas. Does that make sense? Assimilated holds the mainstream American values in high esteem to exclusion of those native. So that one is, I am Native American, but I value the Western culture because that's the dominant culture and I see their values and I accept it and I respect it. And then pan-traditional would be kind of like holding both and also really focusing on your native to bring it back up and make sure that's still alive. Um, Christianization was one way assimilation was accomplished. So it was basically kill the Indian and save the man, is a general Henry Pratt had been said. And in this slide right here, you see a picture of this Native American boy in his Native garb, right, in his traditional clothing. And then what happens to him once he becomes basically westernized or civilized, quote unquote. Um, obviously, you see a loss of culture, right, in this poor child. And that's very, very sad. But this is something that is part of American history that I hope that you acknowledge, okay? You don't have to say, oh, it was my fault or anything like that. And this is not an attack on current Americans. We're just saying our history has a lot of violence, uh, psychological as well as physical violence. And we must acknowledge and recognize that this did happen and not forget that there was a lot of this violence. And this is why Native Americans have a strong distrust towards uh, the American government now. So children's hair were cut, traditional clothing was taken away, American Christian names replaced native names, um, only English was allowed to be spoken, and native ways were seen as uncivilized. And this is why you'll see Native Americans with very Anglo names or very Western names like Joseph, right? Um, and that was part of the history is that they were forced to lose their Native American names and adopt Western names. Now let's talk about cultural philosophies and values. Personal accomplishments are honored and supported if they serve to benefit the entire tribe or collective. So commitment to peoplehood, spirit of resilience, the spirit of being able to bounce back from trauma, and strong sense of identity. Believe in the supreme creator, both male and female, in command of all elements in existence. So what that really talks about is the fact that Native Americans believed in uh, uh, basically creators that were both male and female at the same time. And Western culture might say, oh, that is weird. No, that is wrong. It is either one or the other. It can't be both. And suddenly over time, over hundreds of hundreds of years, basically people start to just believe it. Like, oh, it should only be one gender when really the original idea was that the supreme uh, creator was both male and female, let's say. 
All things in the universe are connected, have purpose, exemplify personhood. So plants, there are tree people, there's animals, four-legged brothers and sisters, rocks and minerals, rock people, land is the mother earth, wind is the four powers, father sky, grandfather sun, grandmother moon, and red thunder boys. So these are all the different things that come along with their philosophy and culture that we should respect them seeing. I know that some of you guys were raised with the Bible um, and don't agree with this. And that's fine that you don't necessarily believe in this, but you must respect that other cultures believe in their own things, right? And then they have the right to also not believe in what you believe in, which is the Bible. And that's something that we need to really learn is respect, right? From all the different cultures. Um, the wellness of the mind, body, and spirit and natural environment is an extension of the proper balance in the relationship of all things. So they really believe in harmony with the nature. Elders are valued because of their lifetime's worth of wisdom that they have acquired, coexisting in harmony with nature, and common cultural values among Native Americans and Alaska Natives. And you can read more about that on page 89 of Table 5.1. Respect for and coexistence with helpful animal spirits. Uh, animals made themselves available to humans only for as long as there was respect from the hunters for the animal spirits, right? So they kind of thank the animals that they will kill to eat for food to survive, right? It's a cycle. Uh, and sometimes in Western culture, when you eat a hamburger, right, you don't really think about a dead cow, right? Uh, you just think of hamburgers, hamburger meat, and that's it. Or a chicken breast is a chicken breast, and that's it. Really, it was an animal that you killed or someone killed to put on your plate for you. We've mashed it up so much that you don't even recognize that it is a cow, right? So when we see native people who see and value the animals in their full forms or in other cultures who do that as well, you think it's gross, you think it's scary and weird, but really we're all eating animals, right? If you guys are not vegetarians or vegans. Um, so anyway, so uh, the ritual treatment of the animals so that animals would, upon their death, return to the spirit world with a good report, which would ensure the success of future hunters. If a hunter was unsuccessful, it could be stated that the animal spirits had not been treated properly. So proper rituals were needed to restore harmony and correct imbalance. So if there was a hunt and it was not successful, maybe something happened, right? And so they would, uh, within their philosophies and stuff, maybe have ceremonies to try to please the animal spirits again and, uh, you know, uh, basically return to the circle of life. All right, so here is a really interesting chap, uh, slide where basically what I am introducing you to is traditional versus contemporary. Traditional means like kind of like older, like, you know, things that have happened for a long period of time. And contemporary means today, right? So the TV foot, which is an Inuit throat singing competition between two women. And usually what you do is you stand very close next to each other and you kind of play this game where you basically make these noises that complement each other, but continue going on and on and on and on. It's like a competition, very respected traditional uh, thing to do. And then I also want you to now introduce yourself to Tanya Tagak, I believe is how you say it. And she talks about the traditional throat singing, but she modernizes it into the 2000s, right? So the first video, the, the first link right there is the traditional way. I want you to listen to it. And it's gonna be really interesting. It's very primal. It's very instinctual. It's really cool. Especially if you've never in, uh, heard it before. It might be a little weird. You might giggle, right? But it's really powerful if you let yourself be into this experience, right? And then so Tanya Tagak will give you an intro on how she does it. Uh, in the second one. And then the third one is her performing at the Polaris Music Awards in 2014. And um, she beat out Drake for Best Album of the Year. Okay, so this is how cool she is. But it is really heavy metal-ish if you listen to it. And I hope you listen to it. It's really interesting. Um, so then you get to see how she uses something that was traditional and modernize it to talk about native issues today. Right. And are there haters on her? Yeah, definitely. There are traditional natives who are like, oh, no, you're changing tradition. But then there are also people like, oh, my gosh, this is so interesting. This is your reaction to how Western culture has uh, has exploited, let's say, native culture. And then um, there are three articles. The first one is the Polaris Music Awards Seal Hunt and Seal Fee, where basically 
um, I think actually that's an interview, a video interview, where she's being interviewed about the fact that she took a selfie of herself, or not herself, her baby laying next to a dead seal that she killed, probably. And that is to show the circle of life that we were talking about throughout this chapter, right? But the thing is, animal activists are going crazy and harassed her, death threats and everything. Of course, that's how social media is now, right? And she's basically explaining that you Western culture people don't even understand what the circle of life really is, right? And so it's a really great eye-opening um, interview to show the difference between native culture versus Western culture. And I hope that you guys really watch it. It's not very long. But it's really interesting and I hope that it causes conversation with you and your loved ones and your professional people as well. And then Tanya Takak, uh, there's a Vice Magazine interview also. And it's an article that she wrote basically saying and explaining Native culture. And also um, the fact that because of her seal fee where there was a picture of a dead seal that she was going to consume with her family and her baby, people uh, basically, and PETA, especially the people for ethical treatment of animals, really attacked her a lot. And she was responding back to them, saying that you guys don't even understand what's going on for reals, right? And it's an interesting one. Some of you guys are maybe PETA supporters, some of you guys are not. Um, I just want you guys to read the article and think for yourself and make your own decisions and understand that both sides could be correct as well. And then um, oh, there's also a Fact Mag, uh, fact mag interview which is basically another interview when it comes to Tanya. And it's really interesting as well. So I just wanted to expose you to more native cultural um, readings and, 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 and celebrations of music and stuff like that. And then here on this last slide is the cultural appropriation. I'm sure you guys are all really familiar with this by now. Here's an article called, Hey You in the Headdress. Know what it means? We often see Native American headdress war bonnets worn at like, let's say, the Victoria's Secrets model, right, in a bikini, and then also at Coachella, right, and how that is actually considered really disrespectful, uh, because it's a sacred tradition within the Native culture. And when people see this, then they get upset, and they have a right to get upset, right? So the article is really thorough and really easy to read. It's, um, I chose articles that were not very long so that you can read through and process it and understand it. And then I also want to introduce you to Bethany Yellowtail, who is a fashion designer. And um, sometimes we, you know, we, we, we take for granted things that are mass produced in Asia or Mexico and stuff like that that are not authentic. And so I wanted to introduce you to an authentic Native American uh, designer and their um, group of people that are also Native Americans who are making Native artwork at the, 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 the prices that should reflect their respect, right? Um, so that's a website. I hope you go and just peruse through the jewelry, the clothing, you know, the, the, the traditions and, and, and see how amazingly gorgeous that stuff also is. And when you do want to wear things that are Native American is to support the Native Americans who are actually making it, not some factory that's making it in Asia or whatever it is. Okay. And then, of course, an uh, article called Culturally Insensitive Tattoo. I don't know if any of you guys are uh, have, have culturally insensitive tattoos. Do you have a, uh, let's say, a dream catcher and you're not Native American, right? So the article talks about a young woman who decides to get a dream catcher tattoo without really understanding what it is all about. Right. Uh, it was originally published in a magazine called Jane Magazine, which no longer exists. However, the website, uh, someone copied it over to this website that I hyperlinked it to. And I wish that you will read it to see the experience of her as a young woman who did something naive, which is get this tattoo that was inappropriate and how she learns to deal with it and cope with it and address it and not pretend like it didn't happen. 